Hello. Geoarchaeology is something that relies very heavily on field work. So inevitably, even if I want to focus on the laboratory methods in geoarchaeology, we really have to talk about that field work. Because um, the geoarchaeologists in the field must collect samples of sediments and rocks and so on, uh, judiciously selecting them to represent uh, particular stratigraphic episodes, site formation processes, and that sort of thing. And then we'll sometimes analyze them right on the spot, and sometimes we'll re retain samples to be brought back to the lab for some other kinds of analysis. Today, I'll talk mainly about the laboratory methods that geoarchaeologists can do, but also a little bit about how they select samples from the field in order to, in order to analyze them in the lab. And inevitably, we really want to focus on the purpose of all of this, which is to understand the various uh, processes that led to the deposits that one finds in and around archaeological sites, and also what, that, what those sediments can tell us about things like climate change, environmental changes of other kinds, including landform uh, change, landscape changes over very long periods of time, and sometimes also short periods of time, because some geological processes can be a lot faster than you might imagine. Geoarchaeologists often take samples of soil or sediment for later analysis in the laboratory. When they do this, they're less likely to take a random sample than a purposive one that targets particular transitions or zones within the soils and sediments. These can be bulk samples for some of the kinds of analyses we're going to discuss later in this video, which we expect to characterize the entirety of the deposit from which they came or they can be core samples or blocks of sediment taken for later analysis for micromorphology. Since we don't have time to discuss all these in this video, I'll provide some links at the bottom to other videos that talk about sampling for geoarchaeology in the field. Many processes result in the removal or movement or alteration of parts of the Earth's crust, among which some of the more important ones are gravity, water, wind, ice, and living organisms. Of course, living organisms include humans, and humans can be responsible for quite substantial changes to the Earth's crust. When material is removed from one place on the Earth's crust, it's ultimately deposited somewhere else. The material in such deposits is called sediment, and we name sediments after the principal processes that resulted in their deposit. Colluvium is sediment that accumulates mainly through the action of gravity, although colluvial processes tend to accelerate when the ground is loaded with water. Where water is the principal agent that moves the particles to their final resting place, we call those sediments alluvium. Aeolian deposits accumulate through the action of wind, and include not only sand dunes, but also lus, which is an accumulation of dust particles. Flowing ice can also accumulate sediment, most notably in the form of moraines. And some deposits result either from the actions of living organisms or from the accumulation of their dead bodies. Once again, this includes human organisms. And many of the sediments that we find either in archaeological sites or in the landscapes around them are the result of human activities. While sediments result from the movement and accumulation of particles, soils result from the weathering of rock and sediments in place. Soil formation takes a long time and results in distinctive zonation or horizons within a soil profile. Biological processes, like the accumulation of leaf litter and the action of insects and worms and microorganisms, contribute a lot to the formation of the upper or A horizon. Percolating water tends to leach minerals out of the B horizon. This tends to alter its chemical characteristics and its color. Minerals leached from the upper parts of the soil horizon can be redeposited or precipitated in the C horizon, often making it hard with a whitish appearance. As developed soils can later become buried by colluvium or alluvium or aeolian deposits, soil formation can occur multiple times in the same location. When this happens, the buried soil is called a paleosol. 
Because soil formation takes such a long time, the existence of a paleosol tells us that its upper surface must have been stable for quite a long time. Note on this slide that the soil horizons do not necessarily match up with a lithostratigraphy or archaeological stratigraphy because they do not represent deposits. We can expect colluvial processes to take place wherever we have steep slopes. The removal of rocks, soil, and sediment from the upper parts of the slope can leave scars, while colluvium accumulates at the bottom of the slope. Colluviation can involve a slow creep of material downslope, or very rapid movement of material in the form of landslides. Whether slow or fast, colluviation can result in the deep burial of many kinds of archaeological sites. It can also result in the removal of both soil and archaeological deposits from the upper parts of slopes and their redeposit at the bottom of the slope, sometimes creating paleosols or what could be mistaken for archaeological sites. Alluviation results from the combined action of flowing water and gravity. When the flowing water of a stream or river reaches a relatively flat plain, the velocity of the water slows down, and particles being swept along by the water tend to drop out through the action of gravity. Large heavy stones, like cobbles and pebbles, tend to drop out first, and clay particles much later. As a result, alluvial deposits tend to be quite well sorted, a topic we'll come back to in a short while. When a river overflows its banks, this also results in a change in slope that causes gravity to drop out large particles first and small particles later on. This can result in the formation of a levee and a gradual rise in the level of the river well above the elevation of the floodplain. These processes have major implications for the location of archaeological sites as well as the likelihood of site burial. As you can see in these slides taken along a dried up river channel, the cobbles and pebbles in and around the river channel are very rounded. The rounding results from many years of abrasion as the rocks are rolled and dragged along the stream channel. Wind can sweep particles away from some areas, like the flat plain you see in the foreground here, and redeposit it in other places, like the sand dune in the background. The wind sweeps sand up the low slope on the windward side of the dune and redeposits it on the steeper opposite side. Consequently, dunes tend to move, creeping in the direction of the wind. But they can also become stabilized if they encounter a body of water, like the classic oasis. But they can also bury archaeological sites, as we see here where a modern mud brick house is being engulfed by a dune. The distribution of particle sizes is one of the important attributes of archaeological sediments. As seen here, there are multiple ways to measure particle size, but sieve diameter is one of the easiest to measure, and consequently tends to be the one that archaeologists use. We determine the size distribution by passing sediment through a stack of nested sieves, usually with the aid of a mechanical sieve shaker, so that only the finest particles reach the pan at the bottom and the other particles are sorted by size in the pans above. While sieving gives us ratio scale increments of particle size, it's typical to classify them on an ordinal scale, of which there are several competing scales. It can also be useful to plot ratio scale size distributions on cumulative frequency graphs like this one. This really nicely distinguishes the well-sorted sediments, like the dune sand, from less well-sorted ones that have a greater variety of particle size. With sediments classified into three categories of particle size, sand, clay, and silt, we can plot a three-dimensional scatter plot called a ternary graph. Any point on the graph corresponds to a certain combination of sand, clay, and silt percentages that add up to 100%. Notice how the increment lines on the graph are angled away from their axis and are parallel to the neighboring axis. 
Here are some other examples, and note also how the triangle of the ternary graph is partitioned into zones that correspond with textures, or distinctive combinations of sand, clay, and silt. One simple way to classify the texture of sediments is something you can just do in your hands by feeling the grittiness or the smoothness of the, of the sediment when it's wet. And uh, you can use a sort of a flow chart that, allow, that walks you through the process of doing this. So I'm going to just show you how that works. I've got two different samples of sediment here. And you put about, not quite a handful, but about 30 grams of sediment in one of your hands. You'll notice I'm not wearing gloves here because uh, I want to be able to feel the texture with, the, with my skin. And then I dribble just a very small amount of water onto that sediment and kind of work it in just by squeezing. I want to get it too wet at this stage. And you see if you can manage to make it into a ball. This is a rather messy process. So I have been able to make it into a ball. However, if you have difficulty making a ball, that's usually because it's either too dry or too wet. So depending on your answer to the next couple of questions, you either drip on more water or add a little bit more dry sediment in order to get the right consistency. And then I'm going to try to, actually I'm going to admit it, it is just a bit too wet. It's too wet, you just sprinkle a little bit more sediment on there and work it in. So the next question according to my, to my flow chart involves squeezing the ball over the top of my index finger with my thumb to try to make a kind of a ribbon. Let me get back into a ball for a second. Actually, I think I need just a tad more water. Don't make it too wet. Squeeze it a bit. If it's impossible to form a ribbon, we conclude that we have loamy sand. Okay, now, I'm going to try pushing it making a ribbon that I push over the top of my index finger and see how long it gets before it breaks. Specifically, we want to know if the ribbon breaks off at less than 2.5 centimeters long, somewhere between 2.5 and, and 5 centimeters long, or greater than 5 centimeters. That one was only about, I think probably about 3 centimeters long before it fell off. So, I can manage to form a ribbon and it was between two and a half and five centimeters long. So that means I end up in this part of my chart. Next thing I do is take the little bit that's left here, which I don't even need quite that much, some of that back. And then I put quite a bit of water in my hand, palm of my hand, and then I just kind of feel what happens when I slide that mud around in the palm of my hand, what's it feel like? And the questions uh, here that I have, uh, the choice of questions I have to choose from, it says, does it feel very gritty? Does it feel very smooth? Or neither? I would say it feels pretty gritty. You can feel little sharp objects kind of cutting into my hand a little bit. And according to my chart, that means, yes, it feels very gritty, so it is sandy clay loam. Okay, so done with that one. Very messy. Excuse me while I go and wash my hands. Okay, we'll now try to measure the texture or estimate the texture of this other sediment. It's lighter in color. Again, we want about that much in the palm of the hand. And we carefully dribble a bit of water on there and kind of work it in by squeezing. You don't want too much water. I might not have quite enough sediment there either to make a ribbon. So I'm going to add some more. Oops, making a mess. So remember the first question is, can you make the sediment into a ball? This one pretty easily goes into a ball. 
Next question again is, can I form a ribbon with a ball? So I'll try squeezing it over my finger. I think I need a bigger ball because it's actually going quite pretty well. It's not breaking, but it's also not long enough to, to really test it properly. So I think I need some more, like a bigger ball. So, because if I want to see if I can get a ribbon that's greater than five centimeters long, I need to have enough sediment to do that. You notice this one is quite a bit stickier than the last one. Already I can tell, it feels quite different. Okay, so I've got, I've got it making a ball. I'm gonna make it kind of an elongated ball. Get my ribbon started. Actually, this one's a bit st so sticky, it's a bit of a problem to even get it to go over my finger. It wants to stick to my finger. Let's see here. Just one second. Nah. Yeah, it's really sticky. That already tells you something. Anyway, let's see if I can get it to go over my finger. It's sticking to my finger instead. Well, anyway, it looks to me like it is also going to break at about the same length, about three centimeters, well, maybe four. But anyway, it's not exceeding five centimeters. So let me put that back in here. I just keep a little bit of it in my hand here that I'm now going to make very wet. And then kind of push it around my hand. And I have to ask, it asks me now, does it feel very gritty? I have to say no. Does it feel very smooth? I have to say yes. It is in fact very smooth, very slimy kind of. So that means we have silty clay loam in this case. Again, got quite a mess going here. Time to wash my hands again. So it's as simple as that. This gives you at least a rough idea of the texture of the sediment without having to use any fancy equipment. So it's actually quite doable in the field as well as in the lab. So as long as you have a copy of this chart, uh, you can uh, try this out at home with a little bit of sediment and see how it works. And you'll find it actually works pretty effectively. The hardest part I always find is trying to make the ribbon. Uh, but it's very important to have that ribbon because it actually has a, an important influence on the, the outcome of the test. You know, whether or not you get a silt loam, a silty clay loam, or a silty clay, for example, will completely depend on that. And I find it's actually kind of hard to get ones over five centimeters long, because not so much because it wants to break, but because it quite often sticks to my finger. So it's really hard to, for me to push it over my finger. Size sorting of particles can be revealing of the processes that led to the sediment. Alluvial deposition tends to deposit particles of largely the same size because they drop out of the water flow when it slows down to a particular velocity. This results in very well sorted sediments. One way to characterize the sorting of sediments is by a simple ordinal scale such as the one you see here. We can also use a chart like the one you see here to characterize the density of the pebbles and cobbles that occur in those sediments. Not just the size, but the shape of particles can be really important evidence for the processes that led to a sediment. For example, the particles in alluvial sediments tend to be quite rounded, while those in colluvium can be quite angular. We can use ordinal scales like this one to classify particles on the basis of their roundness. Particles in sediments sometimes occur in aggregations called PEDs. The shapes of these PEDs can also be revealing of the processes that resulted in their formation. For example, platy or laminar PEDs can occur at the bottoms of ponds when clay particles settle in standing water. To measure the color of soils and sediments, archaeologists routinely use something called a Munsell soil book or soil chart. Uh, we also use this for measuring colors on pottery and other kinds of things, but it was really designed for soils and sediments. And, uh, you'll find that inside this book it's divided into sets of pages that look basically like this. 
Each page is designated a different hue, like 7.5R or 10YR, 7.5YR, and so on. And then within each of those pages, you see uh, rows for what is called value of the color and columns for the chroma of the color. And each of those are numbered on an ordinal scale. For example, on this page for a hue of 10YR, we might have a value of 4 and a chroma of 3, resulting in a Moncel color of 10YR 4 slash 3. One of the things that's important to emphasize about the use of Munsell soil books is that they have to be used under the proper conditions. In fact, actually, uh, the conditions in this lab right now are not quite right because I have to have extra lighting for uh, the purposes of the, of the video. But ordinarily, what you want is indirect natural sunlight. Uh, so actually, if I turned off the overhead lights and whatnot in this room, it would actually be pretty good because I have nice large windows uh, next to me here. So if you're doing this to analyze soils or sediments in the lab, it's good to do it in a lab that has good natural light. You don't want direct sunlight, however, you want it to be indirect. So right now, because it's afternoon, the sun has kind of moved away from uh, my windows, so I have a nice bright, uh, it's a nice bright sunny day, so I have nice bright natural light, but it's not direct sunlight. That gives you the most accurate uh, measure of the color, you, whether you use a soil color chart or an electronic meter. Assuming the lighting conditions are adequate, the way you measure the Munsell color of a sediment uh, is that you first of all ensure that the sediment is moist but not wet so that the colors come out. And then you pick a page in the Munsell soil book that has a hue that you think is likely to be a good match to the sediment you have. Sometimes you have to try in, on two or three pages before you get the right one. But here I'm going to guess that it's a 5YR. So I'm going to try to use the 5YR page. And you'll notice that there are little holes in the page. The reason for that is that you don't want to get the color chips dirty. So we hold the sediment behind the page so that it can peek through those holes and we try to find the color chip that matches it the best. Now this is a fairly dark sediment, so it's going to be near the bottom of the page, fairly low value. And uh, I'm not sure how well you can see it on the camera there, but I think it's a pretty good match for, yeah, it's a pretty good match for this chip here. So that means it's a hue of 5YR, the value is 3, and the chroma is 1. So we would record that as 5YR 3 slash 1. This time I have a lighter sediment that I'm guessing is going to have a hue somewhere in the range of 10YR. So let's try the 10YR page and see how we do. Which it might be easier if I take the page out. So put it in behind and see where it matches up. Yeah, it looks like we're probably going to get a match on this page. In fact, it looks, looks pretty good. Or I think the best match is this chip here, which means it's going to be 10YR 6 slash 3. Again, a hue of 10YR, a value of 6, and a chroma of 3. Now, as it happens, the Munsell company that makes these uh, books full of soil color charts uh, nowadays also has an electronic color meter that you can use to quantify the color of your soils, sediments, pottery, or whatever uh, automatically. Uh, they're a little bit expensive still, um, so, but, so that these things are still a little bit more cost effective, uh, but the price is coming down and I think those will become more and more often used by archaeologists. Other options available are Monsell Color apps that you can run on iPhones and Android devices. The pH of soils and sediments is also related to their conditions of formation. Sediments that accumulate in marshes, for example, can be quite acidic, while calcareous soils and sediments that originate from the weathering of chalks and limestones tend to be quite basic or alkali. Knowing the pH of sediments can also help us anticipate whether or not excavations will, are likely to encounter certain kinds of materials such as animal bones or plant remains. We measure pH on a scale from 1 to 14 with low numbers representing acidic and high numbers basic or alkali substances. Alkaline substances are bases that are soluble in water, such as chlorine bleach. 7 on this scale is neutral, 
representing the pH of distilled water. Most archaeological deposits range between 4 and 9 on this scale. A simple and inexpensive way to estimate the pH of a sediment is to dip an indicator paper called litmus paper into a suspension of the sediment in distilled water. When the paper changes color, we then compare it with the chart you see here to see what its pH value is. However, this doesn't provide a very precise measurement of pH. We can easily measure the pH of sediments by using an electronic meter like this one here. It's very compact, but like any instrument, it needs to be calibrated. So the way we do that is by using some buffer solutions that come with the product. Um, they come in bottles like this, or they come in pouches. And for today, I'm going to be using two calibration buffers, one with a pH of 7 and one with a pH of 10. And to calibrate them, we just open the pouch. Pour some of the buffer solution into a little beaker. There. And then we take, the, we take the meter, and incidentally the meter will always have a little rubber cap that's intended to protect the electrode and keep it from drying out. So when you're storing the meter, you always put a little bit of storage solution inside that rubber tip when it's on there. But for obviously doing measurements, we take it off. And then for doing the calibration, we first press on the power button so it comes on, and it'll display usually the last measurement that was taken or something like that. And then we hold down the power button for a couple of seconds until the display reads CAL or CAL. And then it'll read 7.01 in this case. And we immerse it in the seven, pH 7 solution. And we hold it there. Okay, it's now satisfied. So it's now asking for the pH 4 uh, buffer solution. But we can actually uh, skip ahead to the to the pH 10 buffer, which I've already poured out into a little beaker here. It's a different color, so to make sure you don't get them confused. So we'll insert it into there. It'll automatically detect that this is not 4. Oops, that should give me an error message for some reason. Okay, no, now it's figured it out, that it should be looking for 10. And uh, so it'll keep looking It'll keep uh, analyzing this until it's satisfied with its calibration. Okay, it now is telling me that it's finished. It says STO, which means it's stored the calibration. So it's now ready to go. I can turn the power off until I'm ready to use it now. Put it back on its holder here. Set the buffer solutions aside. In case I'm on, it's not a bad idea to check the calibration again at the end. Uh, make sure that things are still good. Um, but uh, now I'm going to show you how to how to measure this, the pH of a sediment. So I have a couple of sediments here that we've uh, looked at before, and I'm going to take some of one of those, and I'm going to measure out 25 grams of this sediment. And in order to do that, I've already measured on a balance here. The balance, incidentally, has already been calibrated, and I know that this beaker is has a mass of, of uh, 20 grams. Actually, I'm going to dry it a bit. That was its dry weight. Make sure it's not, not affected by a little bit of moisture in there. We'll just check that. Yes, it's 20 grams. And then what I'm going to do is measure out some sediment. I want to get about 25 grams of sediment. So that means this should be reading 45 grams when I'm satisfied with the amount. That's 36. It needs a little bit more. 45. Okay, so we now know that there is, that we have 25 grams of sediment in this beaker. We want to add to that 25 milliliters of water. So that means we have equal mass of water and, and sediment. And uh, because water has a density of one, and we use distilled water for that. So here we have a bottle of distilled water, and I'm going to measure it out with this graduated cylinder. Funnel here. 
cut the cord too fast. Let's get that out of the way. That's probably a bit too much. Okay, finally, we now have 10, 10 milliliters more. So we'll add that to the beaker. And finally, we need five more milliliters. pretty close. But that's good. Dead on. Five milliliters. So we add that. So we now have 25 milliliters of water and 25 grams of sediment in this little beaker. Get those out of the way. So what we want to do is stir that slightly. So do Stir it up to get it in, to get the sediment into suspension. So we turn the meter on. Now, one of the things I should mention is that it's recommended to use this uh, when you use these meters to have it inserted into the liquid about four centimeters or one and a half inches thereabouts. Uh, this one I'm not going to be able to insert it quite that far, but what's very important is you shouldn't uh, insert it farther than about here. There's a mark, there's a little marker on here called an insertion line. You should never insert it long, uh, high, higher than that because it will damage the instrument. So I'm going to insert it into the liquid. I'm going to tilt it a bit so I can insert it a bit higher. And turn it on. And uh, after a few seconds, the reading will stabilize. Uh, it sometimes fluctuates a bit at first. Uh, it's still fluctuating. But it now seems to be settling down. It did go up as high as 8.2. Whoops, now it's down to 7.9. Okay, it seems to have stabilized at 7.9. So that's a pH of 7.9, which is a little bit higher than neutral. Uh, it means it's slightly basic sediment, not, not terribly basic. Okay, so now we can get rid of that sediment well, as best we can. And we also want to rinse off the electrode with some distilled water. So the next measurement we make won't be affected by traces of the one we just did. Using a clean dry beaker, we'll now repeat that process using a different sediment sample. So again, we know this beaker weighs 20 grams, or has a mass of 20 grams, technically. So we'll put a certain amount of sediment in there. There we go. It's now up to 45. Take it off, it goes back down to zero. So we know it's still calibrated. Now, we again want to measure out the distilled water. Uh, the last time it worked a bit more easily if I use this cylinder. This is not a graduated cylinder, unfortunately. Okay, that's it. There's 10, so that makes 20 in total. And now we need five. Well, that's pretty close, actually. Yeah, that's good. So we now have, once again, 25 milliliters of distilled water and 25 grams of sediment. Set those aside. Stir that up a bit to get the sediment into suspension. We turn on the meter, insert it in the sediment, and it's always good to stir it around a bit. It may be stabilized now. It looks like 7.7. .7. If I recall correctly, the last one was 7.9, so that's not a huge difference. I was thinking this one might be above 8, but apparently not. Later, so once we're finished doing all of the sediments we want to measure, normally you'd be doing a lot more than two. As I mentioned, it's a good idea to um, 
repeat the calibration or, or repeat measurements on the buffer solutions just to make sure that your calibration hasn't drifted off. And then we want to put, put the meter away in storage when we're done. So again, we want to rinse it off with some distilled water or a cleaning solution. I'm actually going to use both. There's a cleaning solution. There's a, some distilled water. And then I'm going to use one of these bottles has this electrode cleaning solution. That was just distilled water in there, so that Kind of rinse it off in the cleaning solution. You can actually pour the cleaning solution over it too, as long as you make sure you don't pour above that immersion line. Okay, that should be pretty clean. And then there's another bottle here that has the storage liquid. What we do with that. Is that we pour a very small amount of that into the rubber tip, the little rubber cap. Doesn't take much, just a couple of drops. And then we insert the rubber cap, and now it's ready to get put away in storage. And that'll, that'll keep it in good shape for probably up to a few months, but every few months you really need to check this and put some fresh uh, storage solution to make sure that electrode tip doesn't dry out. The character of the sediments that we find in deposits within archaeological sites can tell us something about the formation processes that created those deposits. Here are just some of the questions that we can attempt to answer by examining those sediments. In addition, Examining deposits outside the site can tell us something about landscape changes that occurred in the site's vicinity. As just one example of the interaction of these geological processes with archaeological sites, let's look at the example of a stream channel that drains a highland with primarily limestone bedrock into a valley some distance away. We start this little animation at a time when there is not much relief so that the stream channel is able to meander around. As it does so, it both erodes its banks and incises more deeply into the bedrock. Over time, it cuts a valley into the bedrock while also depositing alluvium along its banks and in abandoned stream channels. In some periods, the level of the stream channel may rise, perhaps because the nearby valley into which it drains has been filled by a lake, which reduces the stream gradient and allows alluvium to be deposited. Later, when the lake level drops, the stream is able to start incising the valley again. Lowering of the water table allows percolating water to form karstic caves in the limestone of the highlands. As the stream incises more and more deeply into the valley, it leaves behind traces of the former valley floor in the form of terraces, where colluvium collects from the erosion of the adjacent hillsides. By the time we reach the modern era, archaeological sites of some periods are restricted to the portions of the valley that would have been the surface at the time. We thus find the earliest sites on the highest ground, somewhat younger sites on the high terraces, and younger sites still on the lower terraces. Those upper sites may be poorly preserved because they've been deflated by erosion, while on some terraces, Burial by colluvium has preserved sites quite well. Inferences of geological processes that come from soils and sediments can be important clues to the environment around the archaeological sites. For example, they can be revealing of the interaction between the amount and distribution of rainfall, the amount of vegetation on adjacent slopes, and the level of water in adjacent lakes. Other evidence, for example from cores, can be revealing about changes in vegetation cover and changes in temperature and humidity over time. Returning briefly to our fictitious valley, the presence of a paleosol on one of the terraces would indicate a long period of climatic stability. 
while artifacts from a site that's in or on the Paleosol help us to date that climatic event. Of course, there are many more aspects of archaeological soils and sediments and geoarchaeology than I was able to summarize in this short video. If you'd like to learn more about those things, you could consult Chapter 17 of my book, The Archaeologist's Laboratory, available from Springer. You'll also find some links below to other videos that deal with aspects of geoarchaeology that I wasn't able to cover here. Thank you and stay safe.